Round two of our Irish presentations. Once again, I'm well aware of the huge complexity of these topics, and all I can do is scratch the surface. We'd hit, I'd have to do hundreds of hours on these, or give you hundreds of books of, with hundreds of links to to really scratch it. But the one of the other figures who is most prominent during the Irish War of Independence or Anglo-Irish War, whichever you wish to call it is this gentleman, Tom Barry. Tom Barry was probably the most successful guerrilla leader for running open stand-up fights. If Michael Collins was successful at running intelligence operations, Tom Barry was successful at running um, small-scale guerrilla ambushes that basically destabilised Cork and a lot of the surrounding area of Ireland and made it effectively ungovernable. This article gives a good brief summary, so I'm going to read out the whole thing. Growing up in the Dublin uh, Way area in the 1960s, we were truly immersed in the exploits of the legendary boys of Cool Michael and their leader, Tom Barry, was in our impressionable young minds ranked as a veritable deity. His book, Guerrilla Days in Ireland, was regarded as the Bible of the War of Independence in East Cork. No wonder I was in awe when I first met Tom Barry about the age of 10 when the 50th anniversary commemorations of the 1916 Rising were going on, followed by the same milestone for the Kilmichael ambush in 1970. It was in the bar of the Victoria Hotel on Patrick Street in that my father, Sergeant Jim Downing, who would have been familiar with Barry from being on duty at the annual Kilmichael commemorations over the years, introduced me to the man himself, who exhorted, exuded a sort of regal era or as he held court in the intimate room, which he frequented with his wife, Leslie Bean de Barra, who also be, played a big part during the revolution years era and was a quite dignified and gentle woman. His wife, is a, who under a maiden name, Leslie Price, is a hugely important figure in herself as an intelligent operative, although her role is sometimes overlooked. It also struck me on seeing them together on various occasions. Subsequently, what a fine couple they made with their personalities, complementing one another. One another. While Barry seemed to enjoy the attention and reverence he got from people at the time, one could also detect a steely side to his character, and that he was not one to suffer fools gladly. One thing that stood out for me was the amount of cigarettes Tom Barry smoked. He used a cigarette holder, which was a form of filler that was a fad at the time. He was an affable character who had no problem making small talk, be it to other adults or to a young fellow like myself, that I sense he knew was slightly in awe of him, but he still managed to put me in ease in his company. While Bit Barry seemed to enjoy the reverence he, and attention he got from people at the time, one could also detect a steely side to his character. So where did the Edomatic Tom Barry emerge from? He was born in Kilorgan, County Kerry, on July the 1st, 1897, was a son of an RIC officer. The RIC, for those who are not Irish or not of Irish descent, was a royalist um, <coughs> Irish constabulary, which was succeeded eventually by the Royal Ulster Constabulary, and then again by the Police Service in Northern Ireland. It was the only UK police force um, that was regularly armed and generally um, Offers in it were chosen to not from the area they were stationed in and were moved around so they couldn't be bribed, well, at least in theory anyway, and were um, posted far away from home. In reality, of course, this didn't work. <laughs> his father quit the police force in 1901 and returned to his native Ross Carberry to set up a business. Young Tom was sent to boarding school in Mungret College, Limerick, but was not an academic type. And he ended up enlisting in the Royal Field Artillery Regiment of the British Army in Cork in the summer of 1915, where he received the military training that was later to use against Crown forces. Earlier the following year, Barry's and colleagues were posted to the front line in Mesopotamia, which included most of what is now Iraq, and he was promoted to the rank of Corporal. But after hearing about that April's Easter 1916 Easter Rising back home in Ireland, he resigned in protest and reverted to being a gunner. Um, I've heard that he was also a sergeant. This is debatable, this bit. In guerrilla days in Ireland, Tom Barry wrote, it was there in the land of the Arabs, then a battleground for the two contending imperialistic armies of Britain and Turkey. 
that I woke to the echo of guns being fired in the capital of my own country, Ireland. It was a rude awakening. Guns being fired at the people of my own race by soldiers of the same army with which I was serving. The Barry of the Great War dragged on as 1917 saw a return from the borders of Asiatic Russia to Egypt, Palestine, Italy, France, and in 1919 to England. Back to Ireland after nearly four years' absence, wrote Barry. I reached Cork in February 1919. In West Cork, I read avidly the stories of past Irish history. What impressed and inspired Tom, Tom Barry most was the 1916 proclamation. The beauty of these worlds enthralled me. Lincoln and Gettysburg does not surpass it, nor does any other recorded proclamation of history. Through it shines the grandeur and greatness of those signatories who are about to die with their pride, their glory, and the faith in their long conquered people. In Barry's estimation, of all the events since the rising of 16, by the far the most important was that which naturally followed the Republican victory at the general election of 19. The proclamation of Doyle Rowan, setting up the government of the Irish Republic as a de facto government of Ireland in January 1919. The rising of 1916 was a challenge in an arms by a minority, he said this was a challenge by a lawfully established government. I'll skip a little bit of that. Um, basically, from this point onwards, Barry became involved with the local IRA um, in Bandon and in his local area. At first, he was mistrusted because of his ex-British background, but slowly won people over. Barry's expertise in training what were effectively raw recruits and exposing military discipline were crucial in the success of his size guerrilla war tactics, which gave him on the edge over what on paper should have been far superior British forces. And now kill Michael. This was probably one of the biggest victories the Irish forces had. Barry was only 23 when the Cal Michael ambush took place, but he showed a maturity between his years in planning and executing it. The word is executing is apt in this context as he saw it to fight to the death between his flying column and the auxiliaries, which con contributed to the controversy about the false surrender being claimed as bogus, created by the revisionist Hart historian Peter Hart, claiming it in, 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 claiming coming into being in his 1998 book. Uh, people, please, you edit your work, caming. Ugh. The late Canadian history professor also led during the War of Independence the IRA, driven by sectarian Catholic motives, carried out ethnic cleansing of Protestants across West Cork. Barry refuted this, admitting they did take a hard loan on people he believed were collaborators with the British forces, and stating that his unit did shoot dead 16 civilians, accused of informing in the first six months of 1921. My own view is it's probably very messy, and there's probably some truth on either side of this. Um, since they're going to go on about Peter Hart and his theories, Peter Hart has a revisionist view of the struggle of the Irish War of Independence that views it as basically totally driven by sectarianism virtually on the Irish side. Um, I would say uh, any such view is simplistic, whoever's pushing it from either, either side. But for the sake of fairness, Hart's theories are still championed by a small cohort of historians and journalists to this day. However, Conor Callaghan, former chairman of the Kilmarnock, and Crossbury Commemoration Committee was keen to point out what he regards as a clear admission that was a false surrender in the memoirs of Brigadier General Crozier, who was in charge of the auxiliaries in Ireland. He wrote of the Kill Michael ambush, the correct story I found to be as follows. The lorries were held up by landmines and the leading lorry was partly destroyed. The men were called upon to surrender and did so, throwing up their hands and grabbing their rifles. Each policeman carried a rifle in addition to a rifle. One policeman shot a Sinn Féinor at uh, close quarters with his revolvers after he'd ground his rifles and put his hands up. Kill Michael ended with, if I remember, sort of, um, I'll go and look at the Wikipedia article next to this to get the exact figure of, of people killed. Uh, we're not talking about huge figures. There are no huge battles in the Hour of War of Independence, but the flying columns held up a very large amount of British troops um, by the time the Irish War of Independence ground to a halt, the British had committed something like 12,000 troops to Cork, 
against sort of Barry's around 300 men. And Barry's men were never armed with anything more than rifles and I believe the odd captured machine gun with a, a few sort of drums of ammunition and improvised bombs. They never had anything in the way of heavy equipment whatsoever. This is a Wikipedia article, which is, it covers some of the same ground, but gives a bit more detail. And it also gives some information on the Cross Barry Ambush, which is the single, perhaps the single biggest sort of battle during the, the War of Independence. When Barry sort of um, escaped an attempt by about 1,200 British troops to encircle him. Um, this is a contentious thing where the um, the British claim that basically you can see the the loss list down here. The British claim ten killed, the Irish claim it's three or four more times that, like more like thirty or forty killed. Uh, it's a bit difficult to know really. We're talking about a hundred years ago, and both sides did have a habit of massaging their casualty figures as needed to kind of soften soften them. The British tended to um, have suddenly lots of training accidents, for example, or or soften the down the blow that way. The accepted figures of people killed on both sides in the Irish War of Independence are, and we'll get to that in a moment. On the Irish side, the accepted figure is about, well, just under 500 dead. And on the British side, about 936 dead, including 523 um, police and 413 army and about 900 civilians dead. So a total fi death figure of about 2,300 in around about two years, which doesn't sound a lot till you remember Ireland is a very small country and having such a figure in a two-year fight in a country of ooh, just over four and a half billion at that time would be quite a nasty business it, and it would impact a lot of people in the country in in a personal manner if you times it up in your head and allow for that you'll soon see how how nasty it really was and why it would leave lasting problems and lasting resonances and lasting issues and why people are still arguing back and forth about it. Um, if anyone wants some more information on this, I'm quite happy to do it, but these are really complex sort of things. And I think most people are going to get very bored if I start waffling on about these events from Irish history. 